Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Timothy. I'm an alcoholic. I'm not going to use this mic. I don't want to. <laughs> Uh, do not want to um, so uh, and I'm also really glad I'm, I'm doing 10 minutes not 40 um, I uh, so I, I guess I I'll just begin with saying that I my sobriety day I'm, I'm still new in recovery I'm pretty new in recovery um, my sobriety day is October 25th of 2016 so I have just under five months, um, and it's not my first time being in the program. I've been in and out for about three years now, and uh, so um, I don't know. One thing I wanted to say is that, you know, as a person of color, as a, a queer person of color, I kind of felt really alone when I first came into the rooms, and... So if you're a queer person, if you're a queer person of color, if you're someone who belongs to a group that isn't represented very well within the rooms of AA, you're not alone, and come talk to me. Uh, but I, since I didn't hear that personally when I first came, thought I'd just throw that out there. Uh, so I do have a sponsor, um, and I'm taking the steps uh right now, uh, beginning that process. So I'm just really going to talk about the the first step because it was the one that I had the most difficulty uh, with the the first time around, uh, which was in March 2014 was when I first got sober. Uh, So I guess a little bit of background information uh, is that I was adopted when I was three. Uh, Three younger brothers also adopted. I I grew up in um, an you know interracial household. My brothers are black. I'm uh, a black person. My father's. I have two dads. They're gay, and I have uh, and they're white. And so it was interesting, you know, when you you go to you know go out to eat and people's heads are turning. So from like a very early point on in my life awkward moments were happening before me. Uh, or at least heads were turning. So I, but I, I love my parents to death and I'm from Colorado. I just moved to California in the beginning of January and, um, and uh, it's been an interesting ride. So that's kind of like my family deal. I'm the oldest or the eldest child. Um, 25, born in 91, <laughs> and uh, to kind of give you some context with my, my uh, you know, what it was like for me in terms of drinking, I started drinking in high school, I drank with friends, you know, I really started drinking a lot, uh, every weekend, parties, football games, it doesn't matter, just hanging out with, with buddies when I was about 16 or 17, um, my junior year of high school. Uh, and then that kind of rolled over into um, when I was a senior in high school. And um, from the get-go, I was always somebody who drank to get drunk. And that was always the goal. I never wanted to just have one. I never bought just one. I pretty much drank as much as was provided or that I bought. And uh, when I bought it, it was a whole, it was a whole lot. Uh, <laughs> So that, from, from, from the get-go, that's how it was. And I had fun, sure, um, in the beginning. But I also, there, you know, beneath the, oh, I'm doing this for fun, I was really trying to escape from some feelings of insecurity and the fears that I had about who I was in my life and, you know, some things like that. And, you know, alcohol definitely relieved or alleviated that those feelings that those fears and just kind of, I don't know, suppress those, those emotions. Uh, and then I, I got a, two weeks after graduating high school, I got a DUI. Um, I was on my way to college and 
basically didn't drink for like six months after that, but then got put on probation. You know, I was smoking weed, you know, throughout the whole time. Well, not pro didn't drink for six months, but smoked and then got put on probation. So I couldn't smoke, but then I drank because I could cheat on my breathalyzer tests. You know, I could just time it out. Metabolism, this is how the body works. Boom, bam. You know, but that's kind of like one of the first, one of the first prominent instances where drinking, um, what was prioritized more than anything else, like more than jail, which is like some serious stuff. You know, I didn't get it. You know, I really, it was drinking was just that important. And so when I, you know, got off probation, I was kind of like free again in terms of not having to wash my ass. I could drink, I could smoke, wasn't a big deal. Um, uh, smoke weed for me, that's what it was. And, you know, the next few years were just kind of crappy. And, um, between the, the year of like tw uh, 2013 and 2014, like March of 2014, you know, I was drinking every day and I was drinking in my room. There's like one day early on in 2013 when I just said to myself, I don't want to go to class today. I just kind of want to stay home and drink. And so that's what I did. And then I started to feel like I, I, I just couldn't be without it. And I didn't really know what was going on at the time. Didn't really understand what alcoholism was. Didn't really know. Kind of knew that it was a disease. But I didn't know, I didn't know what was going on with me and drink. I never wanted to look at drinking or smoking weed as, as something that was, that I needed to change um, or that I was willing to give up, I guess. So then I got to, um, the point where I just, I was at an all time low, um, in March, around March of 2014 and, I ended up going to treatment, you know, I ended up withdrawing from the university, um, moved back down. You know, since I'm from Colorado, my school is about an hour north of there in Fort Collins. And I moved back down with my parents in Denver, you know, after going to treatment. And I was in AA, you know, I went to meetings when I was in, you know, treatment as well. Um, but I was in AA, I stuck with AA for about six months and uh, didn't get a sponsor though. And Loved meetings, went to meetings, totally identified with pretty much everything people said. Uh, but I just couldn't, I always thought that maybe one day I could, I could drink again. And I, I didn't know how far up the deep end I had gone. Maybe there was some, I was trying to, you know, it was kind of like a reclamation of that power that I, I really wanted to have. Um, so I just thought I didn't need AA anymore. And so after probably six months of going, I moved back up to my college town. I got nine months, I relapsed, things were bumpy for a few months, and then I ended up getting a year, but I still wasn't going to meetings, uh, and then in May of last year, so 2016, I uh, went through a breakup, it was, you know, super painful, I was angry, I was lonely, and I didn't, I wasn't willing to turn to anything, because I hadn't been catering to anything that I could turn to or that I was willing to turn to. <clears throat> so I couldn't, I wasn't going to turn to a program. I wasn't going to turn to alcoholics. I was just going to turn to the only thing that I had been turning to for a long time, which is drinking. Um, you know, so I was out for about, you know, between like May and, and October, about five months or something like that. And I think like two weeks in, two or three weeks into the relapse, I was just like, this is not going to work because I knew, you know. I just knew that I something was really not okay with what I was what, with what I was doing, and then I was like kind of angry too because I was like you know they were right you know they you know they being me now and uh, <laughs> they, they will screw up your drinking and it really really did it really really did I just like I just could see so so plainly you know what was happening and while this time. Because I was living with my parents in Denver at that time, it was like I couldn't drink the way I wanted to drink. And I started realizing that I didn't want to drink like other people, that that fixation upon drinking normally, that was not the case. I knew I wanted to drink, and I knew I wanted to drink a lot, and uh, that wasn't normal. And But I couldn't drink, so I was trying to control it, and 
you know, there's a story in the back of the book that's tough, you know, this a woman says when she tries to control it, she can't enjoy it. When she enjoys it, she can't uh, control it. That's how I felt. And I was constantly trying to control it, and I became this maintenance drinker, and I was just feeling really low. And then on the backdrop of things, I ended up getting um, into school out here, and I just I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do school if I wasn't sober. And uh, <clears throat> but as the you know over that five months, I just couldn't get it together, and so. Anyway, at the the end of October, I just kind of decided to, I was like, you know, my birthday's coming up. I'll just have my birthday. I'll come back to the rooms and we'll do it. And that's what I've done. And uh, I'm just in a place where I can accept that, you know, I'm powerless over alcohol and that my life had become unmanageable. So that's that's all I got. Thank you. And then our main speaker tonight is Gabrielle. And yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Gabrielle, and I am an alcoholic. Gabrielle. Gabrielle. I guess I'll follow his lead and stand. Um, so you guys can see me in the back. <coughs> no, no. I wish you had been the forty-minute speaker because uh, I think you were, you were like, I don't know, just like so close to telling my story. I was like waiting. You know, you, you were you were getting in it. Um, so I want to thank Alexa for asking me to come out and share my experience, strength, and hope. And I also want to just say it's nice to see some familiar faces. You know, a lot of you guys, um, I've had the opportunity over the years to just see in meetings and some of you I've done service with or our paths of cross and service, um, and whatnot. So, um... Now that all the nice keys are out of the way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, um, and I also want to thank my girlfriend for coming out and supporting me. Um, we were in Manteca all day at a family event, and it's really nice to, you know, get the support. Uh, you know, I've been feeling kind of uh, by myself. Um and I, I'll say, you know, that that disease of alcoholism makes us think, even if we're in a room full of people, or we could be surrounded by, you know, our cronies, whoever, and still feel alone. And what I realize, excuse me, you guys, I'm not trying to be that girl or anything, but I mean, <laughs> okay, excuse me. <laughs> um, um, you know, we start or I start feeling that feeling of um, not being a part of, you know, and what it, the only answer I have for that is I need to get to more meetings. And I need to put, throw myself in the game, even if it's not an A, meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, if it's at work, you know, it's like, how can I be of service to someone else where I can get out of that frame of thinking that, you know, oh, poor me or what, you know, whatever. And so, because so many of you, um, well, in particular, you in the front there, the rainbow shoes on, I know <laughs> I've, had, I've had the opportunity, I've watched this guy. I don't even know his name or I forgot your name. I know your girlfriend or knew your girlfriend, but I know that you've done like mad service in this program. I mean, I'm talking about like when Norman used to be the whatever the program to whatever he, his title was guy. King Norman <laughs> he uh, was in major service and you know that's what we do here I know Alexis you know has been in like incredible service she's a full time student I mean this is what we do and I think my friend oh there he is he's way in the back um, you know some of the brainiacs like him you know like they start getting gray hair because they go back to school I'm trying to avoid that one, but, um, yeah, you know, on the serious side, you know, we, this program is amazing. You know, like they say that there is a solution. There really is a solution and it is in the rooms. It's in the book. It's with our sponsors. It's in service. It's in the people that we meet. And, um, yeah. So, okay. More about me now. Um, so my sobriety birthday is June 29th, 1992, which means this 
June, God willing, I will be 25 years clean and sober. And what that also means is that I got sober when I was five. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know. See? That's right. We were crib buddies, you know? Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, the um, people, you know, sometimes there's a fallacy around the time that someone has and thinking like, oh, they've got it all figured out. And I say more is always required, you know, um, just because you have time doesn't mean anything. I mean, it means something. It means you've got time, but it doesn't necessarily. And I love hearing my uh, friend, Jesse, uh, if any of you go to the in-between fellowship at 11 a.m., you know, little old Jesse that goes to the upper room on Wednesday night. He always says, he goes, you know, my name is Jesse and I may not always be uh, sober. And he's talking about his thinking. You know, and I understand that because my my thinking is not always sober. I have a tendency sometimes to not be emotionally sober. And uh, and again, you know, I feel so grateful because this year um, and maybe it was towards the end of last year, last year, um, you know, I felt like my program needed something. And, you know, we, we have these points in our recovery where it's like, oh, it's time to do something different. And, you know, I was going to a lot of meetings, you know, at least three times a week, two to three times a week. It wasn't like I had fallen off, but I wasn't really plugged in. And what I mean by that is I needed to really get to dive into the book. I needed to dive into the 12 and 12. And so um, I uh, asked this woman who had 30-something years clean and sober, uh, who seemed like she was a pretty jolly fella. You know, she seemed like she had it, you know, she had some things that I liked. And, uh, you know, I asked her to be my sponsor. And um, I had been working with someone else. And um, I knew this other woman for a long time. And, you know, she's a yoga teacher. She's really beautiful. And she's got a lot of time. And, uh, but she lives in another county. So we were only seeing each other like here and there. And now I see my sponsor like twice a week. It doesn't necessarily mean we're getting together and working on the big book every time we see each other, but I get to see her once a week where we have a dedicated hour together. And I also sponsor, uh, I'll say 3.5 women now because one of them just moved to San Diego to pursue her career. And, um, you know, those are all gifts of the program, you know, um, and man, I'm just I'm thinking 40 minutes. That's a lot of time to <laughs> fill up. Jeez, you guys got me sweating already. Um, so I guess what I could do is talk about what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Uh, so what it was like for me, um, I started drinking, uh, I guess you could say in high school, um, I became fast friends with this woman, Patrice McKinley, and we, uh, she had an out-of-state ID from, um, I think it was uh, the University of Illinois, Champaign, Illinois, and, uh, yeah, how coincidental, <laughs> Champaign, Illinois. Yeah, and even worse to add to that, our favorite drink, because it was cheap, was uh, cold duck, uh, speaking of champagne. <laughs> um so Patrice and I would go and uh, score, you know, our, our alcohol at, uh, I guess, what would be like a Vons. And I grew up in Southern California. So, you know, and let me back up a little bit. You know, I come from a two-parent household. It wasn't like, you know, there was any, like, severe trauma that I experienced as a kid. Um You know, my mom and dad were kind of like socialites. You know, they were good people. You know, um, they were they were good people. And so I don't really think that I wanted for anything. But I do know that when I was a young person, I know that I kind of felt on some level like a little different. You know, there was something about me. I felt a little bit different. I always feel connected. And I think on the outside, you know, I may have seemed a little gregarious, maybe sometimes withdrawn. I don't know, but somehow I caught this disease. And what I can say is that I have, um, 
this disease runs on both sides of my family, but especially on my dad's side. Um, I had both my grandfathers, my mom's father and my dad's father were alcoholic. And, um, you know, I have a, a great grandmother who's Cherokee Indian and she, you know, with, you know, back in the day, they didn't even give Indians alcohol because, you know, they acted like fools. So I have, whatever it is, I say the genetic predisposition to be an alcoholic. And, um, you know, it's been a, a, I learned that early on, fortunately. It wasn't something that I had to kind of like, I mean, I did literally, you know, scuff my knees and bump my head, but I get, I'm glad that I caught this disease early because it gave me the time, you know, and I had a lot of stuff I needed to work out, you know, somehow in this lifetime, there's been a lot of stuff I've been dealt with and uh, had to work out. And I feel grateful that Alcoholics Anonymous has been my, um, you know, my, my ship, my guide ship. Um, so anyway, back to the parents and the, the best friend, um, that was how, you know, every, it seemed like every time I drank, you know, I would either pass out or throw up. There was always something that happened and there wasn't just, you know, casual drinking. It was like the way you described it. You know, there was, I was drinking alcoholically from the very beginning and I was a lightweight, so I couldn't hold it, you know, very long. I would get high really quickly. So I guess I could also say I was a cheap date, but you know, it just, it didn't work out. And I, like I said, I'm, I'm glad that the drugs and the alcohol stopped working for me relatively early because, um, you know, there were cars totaled, uh, hurt feelings, you know, um, there was an intervention done and I went to this rehab, um, on the peninsula and, uh, you know, there were, I guess, some of the best clinicians over there, but it still didn't keep me sober, you know. Um, I was at Stanford. It was like, you know, I walked into the rooms over there, and all those people were old like I am now, you know, and I was just like, I have nothing in common with them. You know, they're they're a lot older. You, you know, that other, that story of othering, you know, it's like, I can't relate to you because of this, or they're all white, or they're this. It's like, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. And I realized that, you know, the thing that binds me to you guys is this, this disease that we have. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, we, or at least for me, I spend a lot of times looking at differences and I talk about that in the book or in the 12 and 12, you know, about the story of different, you know, and I think that keeps us separated, you know, as long as I can see that, oh, I'm different, you know, did I make a song about that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, as long as I don't see myself in the next person, I can't really identify and it's going to keep me separated, whether it's from the rooms or separated <laughs> from that group, you know, it's going to keep me separated. And, um, when I finally caught that, you know, I've got this disease and I, I am just like the next person. Um, cause I was in a room full of people that look just like me and I was looking at differences. So that's why I'm saying it doesn't, it's, it doesn't really even matter. You know, it's like whatever that is we do, you know, I was doing that. And so this is my third time around. I didn't get sober right away. I walked into the rooms when I was, I think the rehab was when I was 19. And then there was sort of like staying sober for a couple of years. And I had a relationship sort of crumble. And that was my excuse for picking up or whatever I did. And um, the last drink I had was... Uh, the day the earth shook, you know, it was June 29th, 1992, literally the, we had an earthquake. Um, I was in Arrowhead with my sister and her, her kids. Um, and that was my sobering moment. You know, I guess it was almost like a spiritual awakening because, um, the day, be the day before the earthquake happened, um, I was, uh, driving around this village, you know, uh, 
and I wasn't that far from the cabin, but I got lost. You know how we're like in this sort of alcoholic, cloudy thinking, and I stopped at a liquor store, and I I did buy a Heineken 40 ounce, and I had never seen one of those. It was like in a, a barrel. It was kind of cool looking. Um, and I was lost. I I couldn't find my way back to the cabin. And this guy, I just picked him up. He was like a little angel. I just said, Hey, I go, you know, I don't know where the cabin is, but if you can help me get back, my sister will give you a joint when we get back to the cabin. And I knew my sister had weed and she did. And believe it or not, it was just literally right up the road. It wasn't even, it was probably like 300 feet. But <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm just, I, it, it was crazy. And all I can say is that night was the night. You know, I got really pissy drunk. Uh, I passed out or something happened. You know, we're not Jewish, but I said to my nephew, you know, he wasn't of drinking age. I was like, oh, you know, we're going to have a bar mitzvah, you know. <laughs> and I was proceeding to get him drunk. And it got ugly because all I can tell you is the next morning I woke up to loud radios and televisions were on and I felt angry as hell because I had a hangover. I was pissed and there was all this loud noise and I didn't know what time it was. I'm looking over and there's a clock that says it's 515 in the morning or something. And, you know, it was a coming to not a waking up. Right. It's never waking up and it's never pretty the next morning it's like coming to looking like shit and feeling like shit and that's what it was so my sister you know gives me the look and she says you know as soon as the road's clear we're leaving you and I'm like what are you talking about and she says well you made a fool of yourself last night and you know there was an earthquake and you slept through you know she's just like pissed and I'm thinking well how could there have been that much damage I <laughs> You know, but there's always more wreckage than, at least for me, there was always more wreckage than I was aware of because I was in a, a stupor. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and, uh, you know, I was reading this book today, uh, and it, it talks about how we're aggressive. You know, we get aggressive. And um, not to say that we can't be aggressive sober, but, you know, you know, I mean, I know for me, I was a blackout drunk. So whatever I was doing, it obviously was annoying enough where my sister didn't feel safe, uh, even though she was smoking pot and she decided to flee the scene. And that's exactly what she did. She loaded the car up with the kids. I think there were like four of them and they left. And I was there and I remember calling my dad and doing the poor me story, you know, oh, they did, you know, she did this to me. And so then my dad was like pissed off at my sister. He thought that that's why I drank because he knew that I was sober. I was like, yes. You know? <laughs> and I said, actually, I, I still want my sister amends for that. But <laughs> it was bad, you know, it, and that's. That's very alcoholic too, you know, not wanting to, like, assume responsibility for our behavior and, you know, kind of, like, hurting folks and being a tornado. And so that was my last drink. Um, you know, I, I made it back to the rooms of AA um, somehow, some way, and I, I think that... You know, I, I got honest about it and I just realized like that whatever I was doing wasn't working. And that was a real slap in the face, you know, to have my family abandon me. Um, you know, it was just sort of like this rude awakening. And after um, I started going back to meetings and I got, you know, I had this, this, uh, this sponsor... There are two female sponsors that I'm thinking of right now. There was Sandy Shaw. Um, well, wait, I first had Pat Lyle. And I remember when I was first getting sober, I had a really hard time waking up in the morning. Um, and I remember Pat told me, she said, you know, you call me every morning at 730. I said, well, I don't get up that early. And she said, well, you set an alarm clock and you call me. And so, you know, being undisciplined, I... 
I did take the direction and I did end up calling her every morning at 7.30. And that was, that put me on that, that path of taking direction. And then eventually I got Sandy Shaw as a sponsor and Sandy said to me, um, cause I had some, actually it was the other way around. I had Sandy first. Um, Sandy said to me that she wanted, if someone in AA asked me to do something, you know, clean out the ashtrays, mop the floor, whatever, wash the mugs, do it. And I was willing to do it, you know, maybe not in that moment, but I I got in the habit of just saying yes. And so, as I said before, I'm from Southern California, you know, and uh, the meetings down there, they do cakes, you know, they clap for everything and they also give cakes out. And so, there was this uh, meeting in South Pasadena. This guy, Scott, was the secretary of that meeting. And this meeting had about 300 people that went to this meeting. And he asked me to be his cake person. And Sandy was right there. <laughs> Take the commitment. Don't turn it down. And so every Friday night, Jaime, you're going to appreciate this. Every Friday night, I had a date, and that was my date. I used to go to Vaughn's every Friday night and pick up this big old sheet cake to feed 300 people. And that was the beginning of me getting rooted in recovery. Well, at least getting rooted in Alcoholics Anonymous and learning how to fellowship. And there may not, I may not have known everybody's name, but a lot of those people knew my name. And if you were an alcoholic like me, where you know, you may have been asked to leave, you know, and not invited back to places. <laughs> this was like a nice, refreshing place where people were welcoming you and inclusive. And it was sort of like that affirming that, oh, I need to be here. This is this is home. And so I did that commitment. I think it was for six months. It might have even been a year. But however long it was, um, I got to know people and, you know, I was, I was young when I came into the rooms. Um, and you know, I may, I still have friends from, uh, early recovery. Um, a lot of those people had a lot more time than I did. Um, and I'm just really grateful. I'm grateful for the old timers. You know, I'm grateful for the newcomers. Um, welcome if you're new. And, you know, hold on to your seat because it's so worth it. And it's not, it's not just, you know, and I, I'm really clear about this. It's not just the people with time. It's the people that are new that I learned so much from, you know, there's so much I get from the stories that I hear from others and what they're experiencing. Um, I'm not working with any newcomers now because most of the women that I sponsor, they all have over 10 years sober, but I mean, it's just like when you're new, you are just like so fresh and bright eyed and bushy tailed and want to just dig in. You know, once you have the crap beaten out of you, (laughs) you know, whatever spiritually or, you know, whatever your thing is. Um, But, you know, that's that was the beginning of my recovery. And, um, you know, what I've done to stay and maintain my sobriety is, um, you know, I continue to show up. Um, and, uh, you know, we were talking before the meeting started, you know, one of the things that I do is I mix it up. I don't go to all the same meetings all the time. Um, certainly I have some regular meetings I go to, um, but I like to mix it up, you know, it keeps it fresh for me. And, you know, wherever I am, like if I'm traveling, sometimes I'll try to get in a meeting then. Um, cause I can go for probably about two weeks before I'll go completely crazy, you know, um, without a meeting. And it's interesting cause people that are not in Alcoholics Anonymous, when, you know, then they know that you go to AA, they're kind of like, well, why do you still go to those meetings? You know, and I'm like, well, you know, it's, I think they stop asking cause it's like, you know, this, my life is completely different as a result of AA. And every time I see someone on East 14th or in those sketchy places on San Pablo, I think, but for the grace of God, you know, because that could be me, you know, it's like seconds and inches away from 
whatever that is that took that person down that that path. And there's no guarantees. You know, people think, oh, you know, I can like slip slide and dip and dab in AA and maybe come up for air and go back out there and try it again. And not everybody makes it back to the rooms. You know, people die every day from the disease, whether it's alcohol or a drug addiction. There's some sort of addiction that keeps people, you know, like they call it that revolving door, you know. And so, you know, the things, like I said, that keep me sober, working with others, I go to meetings at least two to three a week. Um, I had to re-up, you know, I got a sponsor, another sponsor, I should say, that um, is holding me accountable, you know, that gives me assignments, that I have work I do. You know, it's, this is a lifetime thing. There's no, like, doctorate at the end of this or anything like that. What we get is peace of mind. And um, that's the thing, you know, that, that, that keeps me sane and sober is just knowing that I have this peace of mind. You know, I'm not running out to my car, sipping out of a flask or running to the bathroom or, you know, freshening up my breath. Because I remember those days just doing stuff. You know, it's, you know, meeting people that like, you know, it says we normally wouldn't mix. I really was dealing with some folks that I normally wouldn't mix with, you know. They could tell you <laughs> stories about it, you know, driving over to EPA. You know, I'm in college going to school and then driving over to EPA to go pick up the stuff. You know, the stuff, you know, it's like, it's crazy. And I don't have to live like that today. You know, my life is super simple. Um, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I'm living with, um, you know, uh, aging parent, an aging parent, you know, my mom died five years ago and I thought that was a big deal. Um, and it was, it was heartbreaking because she was my best friend, but now I'm dealing with a father who will be, he's 82 and he has dementia and, um, there's all these layers of stuff that happen as we stay sober. And I just say, you know, stay, you know, just stay, um, I went to one of those international conferences. I've actually been to three of them, but there was one woman, this Irish woman, and I could see her on the teleprompter. And uh, she might have even worn green now that I think about it. <laughs> but she was beautiful. She had white hair. And I remember her just saying, you know, just stay. And that stuck with me. It's like, if all else, just stay, you know, because there is no guarantee that we will have the opportunity to come back. And, um, you know, I know that it, it may sound like rhetoric, but it is. It's, you know, let it be rhetoric. It's, uh, it's the very thing that give, the very thing that gives you life can be taken away when we forget. And, um, or I should say the very thing that gives me life can be taken away if I forget that I need this. And, you know, it's like, if I don't want my teeth to fall out, you know, I better floss and brush. You know, <laughs> and maybe use deodorant if I don't want to be funky. You know, <laughs> I need to come to room. I need to come to the rooms of AA. Um, you know, if I want to stay here and uh, live a better life, and you know, they talk about being rocketed into the what is it, the fourth dimension. You know, I'm waiting. Uh, but the promises, <laughs> the promises have come true. I mean, there've been moments of the rocketed into the fourth dimension, but the promises have definitely come true. And uh, I know that the skills and the tools that I have here, because there's not a meeting that I haven't gone to where I haven't heard somebody talk about the death of a parent, the death of a, a grandparent, the death of a child, you know, a parent with uh, some sort of disease or they themselves, you know, are in the rooms suffering, you know. And it doesn't mean that because we're going to AA, our suffering stops. But what it means is we have a way, we have, a blueprint. That's all it means is that we have a blueprint and it can't, it doesn't have to be doom and gloom. It can actually be a life that does lead us on that path of happy, joyous, and free. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.